Hi, I'm Maureen, and welcome to a special episode of Cabin Life with Glenn and Maureen. Today we're featuring another segment of the series, Buying Land and Finding Your Dream Property. Thank you for joining me, and if you're new to our channel, please consider subscribing. And remember to click on the notification bell so that you'll be notified of what's coming up on our homestead and off-grid cabin here in our 40 acres of the woods of Ontario, Canada. The series Buying Land and Finding Your Dream Property was created so that Glenn and I could share our experiences and the knowledge that we've gained over the years looking for buying and selling properties. Now the series is aimed more towards looking for properties in rural and remote areas. However, if you're looking for a property in an urban area, you can use the same information to help you look for those properties as well. Today I'm going to touch on the basics of reading a plan of survey. Now basically there's six elements on a plan of survey that you need to know to be able to read it and decipher it. Whether you're looking at a plan that's a basic outline of one piece of property or whether it's a complex plan such as this one here. Now the reason I chose this plan today was because of its complexity, because I wanted to show how it is possible and quite easy to find the information that you need on such a busy plan. My goal today is to help you learn the basics of reading a plan of survey so that you can find the information that you need when you're looking for a property. Glenn and I looked at a lot of properties through the years and after a while we found that we needed to hone down our method of looking at properties because it was taking us away from home a lot and the costs were really adding up. So we thought it's time to do it on the cheap. Now one of the answers that we came up with was starting to look at a plan of survey sooner in the process because we found that looking at a plan of survey answered a lot of our questions. For those interested in looking for more information about buying land and finding your dream property, I suggest that you take a look at our playlist. It includes all the segments that we've created so you can find your dream property. A plan of survey includes six elements. There's a plan number, the unit of measure, the scale of distance, the compass rows, current information and historic information, and of course survey monuments, the legal markers which surveyors use to mark the boundary of the property on the land. Okay, first of all, the plan number. Now you can find the plan number in the legal description. Now how you can find the legal description? I would suggest you contact the real estate agent and ask them for a copy of the legal description and the best would be a copy of the deed. And if you'd like to learn more about reading a deed, I would suggest you take a look at episode 28 doing the deed. Now once you get your legal description take a look at it and it will tell you what the plan number is and the part numbers describing the property that's listed for sale. Typically a plan of survey is drawn in either imperial measurements by feet or in metric measurements by meters. Now it's important to know which is which on the plan of survey you're looking at because if they get mixed up that can make a huge difference. Like one meter is approximately three feet. So it's important to know what the unit of measure that you're looking at. Now in Ontario, Canada, plans of survey can be drawn in either imperial or metric measurements. If they're drawn in metric, there's what's known as a metric box included on the plan. And that gives you the calculation which you need to convert from the metric measurements into feet if you prefer to work in imperial measurements. While surveyors are drawing the plan of survey, they need to scale down the measurements and the information that's on the land so it'll fit on a piece of paper. So on the plan they display what's called a scale of distance and that tells you the ratio between the measurements on the land to the measurements showing on the plan. Every plan of survey includes a compass rose. Now the importance of that is that that shows you how the plan is oriented to north. Now looking at your list of must-haves and wants and looking at the compass rows, that could answer a lot of questions for you because if you have plans on how you want the building situated compared to north or south, well you'll be able to see how the lot is oriented to north or south and see if that's suitable for what you want to do with the land. Now also the compass rows is a tool that you'll be using when you go out to walk the perimeter of the lot because you'll use that to line up your compass. 
Now, speaking of compasses and the compass rows, for those who are just learning how to read plans of survey and how to um, walk the perimeters of lots. If you're not familiar with how to set up a compass, I strongly recommend that you take a course in orienteering. Plans of survey refer to astronomic north, not magnetic north. So the bearings on a plan of survey are astronomic bearings and you need to set the declination of your compass so that it adjusts for the difference between astronomic north and magnetic north. So far we've gone over the plan number, the legal description and how you find the plan number, the unit of measure which is used on the plan of survey, the scale of distance which the surveyor used, the compass rows, and the importance of it in looking at a piece of property. And now we're going to look at the current information and the historic information which is included in the plan. When I first started reading plans of survey, I found them so overwhelming, especially complex plans like this because there was so much information. But it didn't take me very long to learn the approach of just keeping it simple and looking for only the information that I needed at the time. And then if I wanted to, I could expand out from there. Now the current information is quite easy to find because the surveyors follow a standard of drawing the current information in a darker line and a bolder, darker text as compared to the historic information, which is drawn in thinner lines and a thinner text. Now let's take a look at a couple of lots in this plan. Okay, now remember we're looking for numbers that are written in bold. So let's take a look. Let's find lot 17. Okay, here it is here, lot 17. It's written in bold, located on Carter's Landing Road. Now let's look at the boundary. Let's find the south the southeasterly survey monument. Now I'll talk about survey monuments in a moment. Now here's the survey monument, it's a little black square. Now let's follow the easterly boundary of lot 17. We go up to the top, there's another survey monument. The bold line continues going west, so let's follow the northerly limit. Now let's go down the westerly limit of lot 17. We're back at Carter's Landing Road and across back to the southeasterly survey monument. There you go. We have just outlined lot 17. Here we can see there's a little bit of historic information. It looks like a driveway, which could be a bonus, right? Like maybe your driveway's already in. Anyways, it shows these, it shows the lines and uh, part 10 and part 9. Now that's historic information from previous surveys. Now let's take a look for another piece of property on this survey. Let's take a look for lot 15 on Hagerman Court. Now this time we'll also be taking a look at the measurements along the lot lines, starting with the northeast corner. We'll head south, southeast 104 meters to the second survey monument, and then we'll change direction and head south 56 meters to the southeasterly boundary of the property. And then over 34 meters west to the southwesterly boundary, up 23 meters. And then we'll head over 90 meters towards Hagerman Court. And then 56 meters back up to the original survey monument. Easy peasy. Remember, look for the dark outlines and the bold text. Now let's get into a little bit more detail about the survey monuments because those are really important for when you go on to the uh, property to walk the perimeter of the land because the survey monuments are what you're going to be looking for as you walk the perimeter. The survey monuments are the legal markers that the surveyors plant on the land to mark the boundary of the property. Now as you can see on the legend here the surveyor used two different indicators to show survey monuments. One is a solid black square and the other one is a white square with a black outline. So we see that on lot 17 there's four survey monuments marking the boundary. But to go to the property we need to know what they look like. That will help us a lot in finding the survey monuments. Now there's codes next to the survey monuments which we compare to the legend and they'll tell us what they look like. So let's look beside this black square and we'll see the code SSIB. Go over to the legend, SSIB. It denotes a short standard iron bar. Now we go up to easterly line, again to the next survey monument, and it says IB. Go over to the legend, IB. 
it denotes an iron bar. Go across the northerly boundary of lot 17, IB, I gain. Go down to the southwesterly limit, it shows SSIB. So now we know when we walk the boundary of lot 17, those four markers that we're looking for are iron bars. Given over time, you know, with leaves falling down and trees growing and vegetation growing, sometimes it can be a little bit tricky finding the survey monuments. And that's why it's important to have your compass and the bearings. They'll help you get to the survey monuments. There's also survey markers. There are red wood posts that stick up quite a bit, and they plant those beside the survey monuments just so they're easy um, site view of where the monument is. In Ontario, Canada, part of the process of showing the boundary of the lot on the land is blazing the lot line. If you're lucky, the blaze will still show, and then all you have to do is go for a nice casual walk along the blaze line until you find the survey monuments. And also maybe a good idea, if you're not accustomed to walking the perimeter of lots, take someone with you who is, or take the realtor with you, so that when you walk the perimeter you don't get lost. Because when you're in rural areas, especially remote areas, it's really easy to get lost. I've covered six elements of the plan of survey. There's a plan number, the unit of measure, the scale of distance, the compass rows, current information and historic information, and of course, survey monuments, the legal markers which surveyors use to mark the boundary of the property on the land. So now you have an understanding of the basics of reading a plan of survey. Now I just want to touch on a few things which are not included in the plan of survey. There's things like the topography, how the land is laid out, are there any cliffs, is it just nice and flat, is there a creek running through it, um, all these little bits of information. Are there thickets of brush? You don't know what it's like. You don't know if it's an old farmer's field that this plan was put on or whether it's in the thick bush or what it is. This plan is actually in the wilderness. It's on a lake. It looks like a subdivision from a city or something, right? But it's actually a subdivision that's in the wilderness. And the lots are anywhere from about an acre to two acres. There's some lots that are up quite high compared to others. There's some that are a cliff. And there's some that are lowland. There's some that are sandy, some that are rocky. It doesn't show you this on the plan. So when you're getting ready to go look at a piece of property, those are some of the things that you need to take into consideration. Like there were some days where Glenn and I thought, oh, we're gonna pack a lunch and we'll have a nice day of just having an adventure through the wilderness. And I tell you, there are some days we had an adventure. Now, when you're going to look at a piece of land and it's vacant, please ask for permission before you go. That's really important because even though it's vacant land, people may be using it. You just don't know what's going on in the land until you get there, so always ask for permission. When you're going to walk in the wilderness, always take marking tape. But what Glenn and I do is to make certain we don't get lost, we use marking tape to leave a breadcrumb trail. We just take a little piece, snap it off, tie it onto a branch where we can see it. And then as we return back to the car, we remove them. They're reusable too, eh? <laughs> you gotta keep it on the cheap. So these come in really handy and it, ga it gives you confidence that you don't have to worry about getting lost. Anyhow, this wraps up this segment of buying land and finding your dream property. Thank you so much for joining me. And please remember, subscribe and click on that notification bell so you'll be notified of what's coming up on our homestead and off-grid cabin here on our 40 acres of wooded Ontario, Canada. For Glenn, I'm Maureen. Over and out and take care.